Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dan Lloyd from Trinity. And uh, this is a familiar formulation of the idea of the rural arts, and um, it's one of Trinity's many mission statements over the years. Um, and we all look for this, but we can't just tell students to go here. We can't just say, get rid of that parochialism there and move on to that. So we need a strategy to arrive at that, which um, we all have our own. I think in terms of cognitive empathy, the ability to think from the standpoint of someone else, uh, the ability to see the world through other eyes. And so when I went into this MOOC experiment, it was with the following questions in mind. On the one hand, can uh, MOOC students in the diaspora around the world encounter some of these values of the liberal arts and some of the uh, techniques um, uh, in the classroom, or can they be adapted into the MOOC context, um, that the liberal arts learning which we do value might be expanded in its scope. Um, in particular, I was attracted by the fact that it was free, that uh, the MOOC is free, and that enables it to be available to a, uh, a population which would not normally have access. My second question then was, once the MOOC gets folded back into the on-class, the uh, on-campus class, is it its own value enhanced in that way? Or to put it another way, is this a way to develop cognitive empathy, to, to MOOCify it by course, as I've done? And so to set this up as a goal is already to put it at odds with the apparent goals of Coursera and edX. Jenny from edX writes me once a week <laughs> suggesting that I take these courses, which are obviously instrumental, professional, kind of career-oriented courses. They're also authoritarian in the sense that these are courses where there's an authority who has the right answer. Um, they're in a career-oriented banking model of education. And so that holds against uh, one conception of the liberal arts, at least. So my experiment in um, educational mixology it is a course called uh, Minds and Brains, uh, a 300 level mm -hmm. course that is an elective both in philosophy and the neuroscience program. Majors in both and lots of other uh, departments take the course. One third, one part of the course is a, uh, um, a tour of philosophical phenomenology. That's the sub-discipline that explores the structures and features of consciousness. Um, and then the second part of this cognitive neuroscience, we ask, how is it that the brain would be the sort of organ that has a phenomenology? And then there's a section on um, neuroethics. And so we're aiming toward the thing called um, neurophenomenology. The MOOCified part then is that first piece, the phenomenology, and I developed a MOOC um, I called The Conscious Mind, a Philosophical Road Trip. Um, and that ran, and that was the first month of the course. And all the class meetings occurred at the same time, too. The way in, I think, to get a sense of what the course then covers, and a little bit of the approach of the course is to watch the trail, which is a little more than two minutes long. First waking seconds to the slide of the bad call there is, and there we are. But what is consciousness, awareness, experience, subjectivity? In this course, we'll examine some big ideas from the philosophical tradition that specializes in consciousness, the tradition known as phenomenology. Phenomenology looks at experience from the inside, so it's going beyond mere sensation, considering the shifting structures of perception from the first person point of view reflecting on the shaping influences of decision and action, examining in many ways our tools and symbols scaffold our subjectivity, excavating the internal experience of space and time, always present and constantly updated, and the central awareness of other minds, other awareness, other consciousness, both real and imagined. Hi, that is Jack. So, uh, the nice Jack. is a special form of as a special form of mindful self-awareness, and the best way to learn is to do it. Through first-person exercises, we'll explore the essential structures of consciousness from your own point of view, through action and observation of your conscious mind at work and play, as memory and anticipation interview with the ever remaining present in an endless dance of change and fixity, continual interplay of the object and the subject. Phenomenology, you'll see, offers a unique way of thinking about thinking, 
a new way of seeing the scene. Ultimately, in our study of consciousness, we observe the infrastructure of awareness and the construction of that web of meanings we call the world. I'm Dan Lloyd, Professor of Philosophy and Neuroscience at Trinity College. The name of the course is The Conscious Mind, a Philosophical Road Trip. Welcome aboard. <laughs> Yeah, that took a lot. That yeah, was that on the work. Um, let's see here. From the present slide. Okay. Whoops. Uh, from the current slide. Current slide. Okay. And so just to break that out a tiny bit, um, these are the units of the course we're granting the month of February. And what I, all I've added there is the authors uh, that we, we discussed. And there are short reading passages for each unit. Um, I looked for accessible um, selections from these authors, but accessible is kind of a relative term when we're talking about Heidegger. And so I did the best I could. Now we all know what the format of the uh, traditional MOOC is. It's the talking head. And so this would be a video, and the videos were short, and they'd alternate with uh, activities. That would be a discussion prompt. Then there would be more back and forth, and then reading, and then a quiz, and then more activity, and so forth for each of these units. The talking head format is already itself a one-way street, and so I attempted to dislodge that from its ordinary function, uh, bringing in props, changing the activities in front of the camera, and so forth, in order to do stuff like transcendence or importance uh, or tools. But also, I tried to dislodge the talking head by switching the point of view and shooting whole episodes from my point of view rather than from the camera's point of view. Um, and we're attempting to move out of the uh, classroom setting altogether, um, at living whole comments on the vision of scientific realism while walking in the woods, imagining what it would be like to be two inches tall, um, and even considering the point of view of other species, the little doggies around the passage in the movie as well. When we wanted to discuss the consciousness of other people, I recruited six students who sat in the semi circle and discussed the Hassar, this morning, go walk. Um, and then when it became the topic became the experience of being seen, this is all phenomenology, the students all broke out their cell phones and pointed them at each other. And whenever someone was speaking, everyone would pivot their cell phone around and focus in on the person speaking. And it was incredibly embarrassing. And, um, and we called this the paparazzi effect. But it, it illustrates um, uh, concepts in, in phenomenology. Overall, then, what I was trying to get students to experience was a reflectiveness about their own experience. In other words, they're seeing the world, the world is there, the world is refracted through a point of view. I also tried to disrupt the kinds of exercises, the prompts that were being uh, set out there to the students. Uh, so, for example, I would uh, have an ambiguous noise, a noise that was unidentified that they would listen to, and then they would conjecture as to what it was they were listening to. The Eidetic platform creates a quick word cloud on that so we could see. The point being that um, we never have pure sensations. We always have sensations which are laden with interpretations. Or when we were talking about the role of tools in our experiences, um, I would present them with pictures like this and ask them, what are the possible uses of this tool? And, um, and so they would produce um, a tremendous number of possibilities for this. Um, one that I like in particular is that it's great for an ad about heroin addiction, about breaking the addict, how about breaking the addiction, um, and you can use it to spell the word love, and so forth, and it goes on like that. The point being twofold here. The students had to go off on their own to figure some of this stuff out, but also they get to see what everyone else is doing. I think that was, uh, was a nice thing. One of the core concepts of phenomenology is the concept of intentionality, which is just the idea that all consciousness has content, it's all of something, it's all about something. And so the prompt was, what are you thinking about right now? And the, and the answer is this, which could I think be the banner flag for the entire course. So I have two populations here. I have my global population, the MOOC at large, um, and uh, and so these are some of them. Um, I encourage postings of sounds and sights. 
um, for the introduce yourself option, you could put up post a selfie and then comment on the background, not on yourself, but where you were. Or just produce the background, or just describe it in words. And so uh, lots of very uh, interesting portraits emerge from that. Not, uh, unlike other MOOCs, uh, uh, many countries were represented. That's always kind of exciting when you see it for the first time. And the demographic <clears throat> spread out across uh, a lot of age range. And as David pointed out, this is very different from what's going on in the classroom part of the course. edX asked a very edX kind of question. How useful was this? And it's, you know, it's plausible in a course like this to say this is totally useless. In any case, the students seem to find most of the uh, components of the course effective. The video lectures, that's good. Uh, but the other two things that were that seemed to be captured and very useful was the discussion prompts, and that was part of me. But they found the readings useful, which I think is probably the first time that Husserl has ever gotten that reading. <laughs> and so I think that that counted as a kind of success. One of the activities, one of the prompts in the course was involving looking back on what they've learned, either from a particular um, exercise or in a general way. And so this is, and so this is where I got this. I mean, there are hundreds of entries here, but it, but what I liked was about was the uh, reoccurrences of words like perspective, diversity, subjectivity, uh, uh, of course, um, and so forth. And there was a great deal of, of that, which uh, we don't think we can do. So the students at large, without being able to quantify this exactly, were absorbing the kinds of of perspectival and uh, cognitive empathy skills that I was sort of hoping for. There's a little thing that was kind of interesting about this as well. The course um, uh, begins here, and the last, the end of the course is here. So this is the uh, curve of attrition. Uh, but the interesting thing is this is just last week. Last week, 68 people were interacting with this archive course which was very striking to just twice as many students as I had in the classroom version, and that's happening right now. It seems to be happening for the year ago version of this course as well. So in a funny way, it's the, the course that keeps on coursing, um, and they're trying problems, and they're actually even in some cases contributing to their conversation. Meanwhile, we have the classroom class, the Trinity class, and they're uh, experiencing the move, but also coming to class, and so that affords me uh, the opportunity to do something very different during the class period. So I've now offloaded the content of the course. Um, and so we can have focused discussions that are wide open. But also I can do activities with them that are not the typical activities that I could have done on the move. For example, put an object next to another object and its meaning changes. And if you have a lot of objects, you get to shape the meaning of something. And you'll never see a sidearm chair quite the same way again. Um, or we can engage in heated debates about whether the dress is gold and white or uh, black and blue. Um, and this splits down the middle. Or we can look at some uh, intensely loaded imagery um, and when we're talking about how other minds are constructed. Um, de developing different scenarios for what we have on screen. What is the mentality in the middle there thinking? Um, that's the kind of stuff that is now available to us in the class. So, um, so asking the students then a set of questions towards the end of the course, and it's a very small sample here. Um, in a general way, they seem to support the, um, that they got a lot out of the blended version. So I asked them to contrast blended versus traditional, and uh, it seems like uh, they found value in that. Um, and this is, by the way, a staff graph that these the meanings are, um, are up along the, uh, are written to the color coding files. So, so they really thought that they learned more in the blank version, and that they thought that the out of class learning was more effective than it would have been in the traditional course, and they thought the in class learning was more effective than in the traditional course. They felt their engagement was enhanced, even though they didn't feel like they were working harder or feeling more challenged in the blank version of the course. But I also asked some open ended questions, and one of them was exactly about this. Are there aspects, this is, I said to them, a mission statement of the of Arts. Are there aspects of this that were enhanced by the move or disenhanced? Nothing came in the disenhanced category. But were there aspects of this that were enhanced by the move in contrast with the traditional course? Where they landed in the majority was this one. Um, and it makes sense because in that point, they cited again and again um, 
that it was the global community that was valuable to them. And I agreed with that entirely. It was certainly very valuable to me as well. And so in that sense, I think the thousands of hours that went into developing the damn thing uh, was worth doing. <laughs> and, um, and the nice thing is I will use this again. So thank you. Jack Doherty at Trinity College. I'm going to talk about this broad theme here of uh, lessons learned from teaching MOOCs um, and reflections on one, this particular one, data visualization for all. Uh, my normal day job at Trinity College is to teach courses with titles such as Education Reform Past and Present for City, Suburbs, and Schools. I have fallen in the need to teach more about data visualization um, because I have more students and more community partners in Hartford asking for more about these skills that I had to learn in order to sort of tell stories about changes in time and place overall. And the slides I'm going to show today, there's several links on these. So if you want to actually look at the slides, it's Google.com online. If you do that Twitter thing, you can find them there. Or just at bit.ly blending-2017 all on your face. So uh, think back to your own campuses. Uh, 2012, it was the year of the MOOC, according to the New York Times and a bunch of the mass media. Did your institution climb a board? Bandwagon? Did your institution vote to stay off? Um, did you have one foot on, one foot off? Um, at Trinity College, um, Trinity took a couple years, <coughs> decided uh, through the action of the president uh, to partner with edX in 2014. And then faculty members like Dan and I have been going along for the ride. We have been very interested in sort of exploring this to see what does it look like, what does it feel like, how does it affect our teaching and learning with our students. Um, but I think that um, uh, we also uh, identify, uh, identify myself as very much a, as, a, as a skeptic of a lot of what I'm hearing about MOOCs. And uh, a lot of what you'll hear today is, is some criticism about what we're seeing on the surface of all of this, with some specific recommendations I have from what I've seen working in my situation. So consider this my travel journal of the bandwagon of MOOCs over the period of time. And as my colleague Dan down all likes to say, your mileage may vary. <laughs> um, so a bit of context here, uh, data visualization for all is the courses that I'm teaching and the products that I'm teaching. I have one label to wrap all of these things together. The general goal of this is very much trying to uh, tell your data story with the free and easy to learn tools. In my case, this means being able to make interactive online uh, scatter charts and other types of charts for data. This is um, uh, uh, school districts in Connecticut by income and grade level, or being able to make interactive point and polygon maps um, on websites as well. Uh, this is an uh, organization, Harvard, that wanted to show um, mortgage redlining for the city uh, based on recent uh, uh, federally available uh, data today. So we create these types of things in these courses, and the two courses I'm referring to is one, for three years now, I've been teaching this face to face internship seminar. It's not even a regular course at Trinity College. An internship seminar means that I see the students just one hour a week, but I am placing them for eight hours a week with nonprofit organizations or government agencies around the city of Hartford where they are creating data visualizations based on the stories that those organizations want to tell with data that they already have. So we've been doing that for several years, and the once a week, uh, we'll often have community partners come and meet us in the session as well. Uh, especially at the beginning and the end for sort of uh, orientation or final presentations. Um, then also the second thing I've been teaching is just this year I started teaching an edX course. Um, it's both for the Trinity interns. I've taken all of that, uh, the online, the content of how to do all of this, uh, move that entirely to an online <coughs> And also at the same time I realized, well, why not open this up to any other students as well? So that's been the combination of blended in my situation here. It's, it's for my face-to-face -face students, it's their course materials as well as for anyone else who wants to learn. And the products that come along with this, well, there's two products as well. The first is, I have, both of these are open access products. Um, one, there's an online book. I purposely decided not to put all the content in the edX platform, but to actually keep it, most of the content um, separate. If it was sort of a instructional content, it's actually in a Gitbook site. If you're familiar with GitHub, this is sort of a, online book platform. 
I've also worked with Pressbooks, which is a WordPress type book platform. And you can click the links and see what this actually looks like. Um, but the advantage of this is that it's a, it's a, all the materials are online. It's uh, easy for me to add uh, content. And people can actually download it as a PDF or as a um, Kindle file or just read it online as most of them do. What appears in the book? Uh, concept videos, short videos where my student instructor and my instructional technologist, uh, Stacy Lamb and Dave Kim and I, have sort of like um, uh, come up with ways of communicating broad concepts briefly, which I didn't exist before. Here we're trying to sort of like show the concept of what does it mean to actually add content to uh, code in GitHub, something that I've had to teach students but never had a tool before to actually show this in sort of a, a conceptual framework. So I have short videos like that, and as well as step-by-step -step tutorials. Inside the book, you'd see pages like this, which are fully interactive pages in the online web version. And they would give you instructions about how to make to go the map make from this layer to this layer and so forth as well. What's in the edX course then? Well, in this case here, um, the book is lots of content. The edX course is a six-week outline of how to get through major parts of the book, along with multiple choice quizzes. Um, I was quite restricted about what I thought it could do with uh, assessment <laughs> materials. Um, um, seriously, other how it elsewhere. Um, so the, the multiple choice quizzes are not the most sophisticated quizzes at all. But I tried doing as much as I could with the open peer reviews, trying to pull up more of a constructivist movement philosophy here of students actually each week are usually creating one of their own charts, their own maps, following the lessons we had, and sharing it with others to get feedback from other students about whether or not they met the design principles. Um, the criteria of the week about how the content is being structured, how the content is being evaluated. Um, my recommendation number one out of this travel journal is I strongly recommend creating knowledge in a free online book to accompany these password protected books. Um, I, my experience was edX in particular is not at all a friendly uh, platform to get content into. I'm not convinced it's a good platform to get content out of if edX ever disappears from your campus or shifts platforms down the road. So I'm always looking for, um, having been on the source a few times now with digital content, I'm always looking for the best platform to put content in so I can get it out of to another platform five years or ten years down the road. And in my case, keeping the best, richest content about the course separate from the MOOC has been the advantage. Um, the MOOC just basically has the assessments. Um, who are the roles at edX? Um, um, uh, our, our president, uh, like presidents of many colleges, um, uh, is telling us things like this at our last faculty meeting. Through the non-credit bearing courses that were recently created, involved faculty have engaged with over 25,000 students from over 100 countries. And yes, um, in my class we actually we have a public survey and students sign up for the class and we actually ask them to explain why they're in the course, to use just a first name to identify roughly where they are, and to see what type of people are doing this. If you want to explore the online version of this map, you can see um, this is a clustered version. If you zoom into South America, you'll see where those 27 are scattered around the, uh, that um, continent there. Um, so this is a true statement. We do have students who are enrolled from many different parts of the world. But I think the second recommendation here is you should rely on your public relations to understand reality. This I recommend is a sort of a general life lesson. Uh, uh, I think uh, don't drink the Kool-Aid is the pejorative version of this. But just basically it's like, you know, be careful what you look at. It doesn't reflect what reality is. In my case here, student participation sharply declined um, in the database for all X course that I just ran. So um, let's play the guessing game in the, in the spirit of our, our first one here. Um, nearly 5,000 students registered. So just shout out this time. How many do you think actually finished? 100. Keep going. Any other comments? 500. Any other okay, so here's what we got. So those who completed the first, these are just people who said, oh, I've got the net email from Jenny at edX. She <laughs> knows I should enroll in this. Boom, I hit the button. So Jenny's very persuasive. And then in the survey, this is actually who completed just that map survey about you know, week one, where are you? Tell us a little bit about yourselves. And then we had a six section course. This is showing the completion rate over time in raw numbers. In fact, only 16% of the registered students actually began the coursework in my particular case. By which may vary. And of those who actually began the course, 27% actually finished in this class. Maybe I pitched this too high. 
or maybe some other factors. Okay, this is average is 25 percent, so you're doing way better. <laughs> so, David uh, asked the next question: Is my dropout rate similar to other MOOCs at Trinity and elsewhere? And my answer to this is. I don't think we really know because almost no one releases this detailed information. I'm not seeing this except for anecdotal one on reactions here or uh, people said this or that at other campuses here. And actually, this leads me to my next recommendation openly publish <laughs> retention data, he said, about beating in the podium, just <laughs> like the accreditors and the government requires to do with a traditional college data. You want to know? Go look at the Fed's iPeds database. If you want to see what the overall graduation rate at Trinity College is, measured over a six-year period, factoring in transfer upgrades and so forth, you can find that information, at least for the whole institution. We, as faculty and staff and just citizens, should be holding our nonprofit sponsored MOOCs to the same standard. If we are truly educational institutions that care about the social good, Rather than just our public relations, we need to get real about the data. And edX, we should be insisting that they do it for everyone as well. Rant continues. Um, please. <laughs> uh, my final thought here is um, I very much, I, I feel like at a small liberal arts college, um, I think that we are playing someone else's game. I do think that the MOOC marketplace very much is pressuring small liberal arts colleges to back into 2012. To jump on the bandwagon, you've got to be just like everyone else. Um, and I think you're pushed to competing with these large research universities. Um, in fact, if you go to the edX Schools and Partners webpage, you'll see them at the top, and you just scroll pretty far down to find the Trinity Colleges and the Smith Colleges and others around that page there. Um, there are some reasons why I don't think we can win at that game the way it's played, and that's because of sometimes just economy of scale. Um, production values, it's really hard for us. We don't have a video editing uh, staff. We are basically making home videos. We're so impressed with what Dan Lloyd does with a GoPro strapped to his head when he wakes up and cuts on his alarm clock in the morning and creatively edits this. So um, there's some neat stuff that comes along, but it's not our forte. So what is my recommendation? Small liberal arts colleges, we should focus on what we do best. I believe that we do an excellent job of engaging face-to-face -face with our students in our normal work, such as having them become research partners, having them become undergraduate TAs, why not extend that model so that students are actually co-authors or co-instructors for these open access books or online courses they wish to create? Um, in my case here, I'm quite fortunate that students like Veronica Armadiris actually was a teaching assistant for one of the face-to-face -face classes and co-authored, actually authored several of the tutorials that are in the book. She gets the lead credit on several of the bond lines. Um, Ilya Ayanku, double major in computer science and studio art. I'm so happy to have encountered Ilya. <laughs> Ilya develops lots of the leaflet and high charts code templates that are he's credited fully for in the book as well. Stacy Lamb um, took the course with me, and um, as a sophomore, I tapped her to be a co-instructor because when we sat down and had our planning sessions, she was the one saying, Jan. We focus too much on just the technology here. It's all about how people tell stories with big visualization. That core element that I kept losing track of myself, just trying to pull the course together. So she became a co-instructor. She uh, wrote out the scripts and did the videos, the conceptual videos with us, and actually here and is credited for those as well. So the big message is, why are we teaching students just to be consumers? The whole point of this, whether it's digital culture or back to Gutenberg, print-only culture, or even urban this, our students at liberal arts colleges become more fully educated when they are the creators or co-creators of this material, not just recipients. That's the end of my soapbox.